Uh, good evening, everybody. This is the third in the final session of our PhD cor coursework presentations. Uh, and in this uh, session, we have presentations on specific area of research. So first of all, Sonaji Rajput will make a presentation on Kushwant Singh's journey as a columnist. Yeah? So Sonaji, you can start your presentation. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, paper three presentation. Rajput Sonaji Baldevi. So, after the discussion of journalism, ethics of journalism, moving to paper three, that is Kushwansi's journey as a columnist. So, most of us know Kushwansi as a novelist or fiction writer, uh, trained to Pakistan, Delhi, I Shall Not Hear, The Nightingale, and many other books are very popular. This is the side of uh, Kushwansi, which was not discovered by, or less discovered, I would rather say, by the research scholar. So let's see his journey as a columnist. So this is the list of the magazines, newspapers, uh, uh, or journals in which he has contributed as a column writer. He has worked as an editor. And starting from Yojna, to India today, whatever he has written, whatever he has published, most of them were a part of controversy. And that is what like, uh, tempted me to do a research work in his uh, column writing works. So how it started, let's see. So they were so his columns were so popular that reader would buy only a particular newspaper on a particular day only. Otherwise, they would not prefer to buy a newspaper. And he hardly spare anybody while writing. He always believed that as a columnist, as a writer, you should write what you believe. And throughout his columns, he supported and criticized and also appreciated openly many newspaper and weeklies are according to Kushwansi are things of habit and there is a comfort factor for the reader who become used to seeing the pace arranged in a particular way so he was very much particular about these things and he changed it he made a lot of changes in this particular aspect <clears throat> what do like according to him in his era like Many editors, what they used to do, many editors today like to preach. They used to preach and care little about presenting facts objectively. So that is why he found the key. And according to him, they are often both pompous and pedantic. So he always wanted the column writer, especially the editor, not to become a preacher. He wrote in one of his book, Malicious Gossip, and even their politic is not an incisive study of major issues, but footling concerned with factionalism on ups and downs of politicians. After a while, leader gets sick and tired of reading the same stuff over and over again. So he want them not to be repetitive. Is one of the most famous contribution to Illustrated Weekly. He openly said that I write to inform, amuse, or irritate. This is the duty of the column writer, according to him. He said they had virtually no forum to ventilate their grievances, except Urdu newspapers, which had small circulations restricted to their own community. I made the Illustrated Weekly a forum for Indian Muslim opinion. This is also an uh, 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 excerpt from one of his book. Now, this is, uh, there are from examples of being blunt. 
uh, he openly opposed the operation blue star he was being a favorite of indira gandhi family but operation blue star was rejected by him i mean he said like i uh, i i would return my padma bhushan back so award giving back uh, award wapsi was also popular that time as well but he stood for what he believed he openly rejected the idea of khalistan he even in a hindu country he openly like supported christian missionary for their support in education institutes about indira gandhi he writes she overlooked corruption and undermined democratic institute now see his daring he openly writes the then prime minister and she was like uh, the one who imposed the emergency in india and she wanted dynastic succession power went to her head she was stern severe and cold and would impose her wishes on people often wrongly so this was his daring in his column the saffron tide about narendra modi he openly writes in his book humra uh, uh, qureshi recently like published that her the saffron tide was rising i was afraid this is the incident taken from uh, gujarat riots that it would destroy the nation for the first time i was seriously concerned for the country's future modi is a murderer this is not too old he wrote i think in 2000 uh, after riots now it was kushwan si he wrote on many topics like this is the comprehensive horizon he did not like spare anything be it politics international relationship gender issues economic inequality emergency political ideology and so on about kushwan si there are many people like they respect his ideas Uh, we as naipaul in one of book he says an appetizing way of writing it's his own brand of patriotism r dhawan in his book writes about kushwansi kushwansi wants to shock and provoke existing norms of victorian morality which he must have been discomforted by in his younger days frontline magazine also mr pillai rod kushwan singh was a writer who could communicate his reader without looking down on them or preaching from a pulpit these are few references that i have taken from thank you very much yes sir. my question to you is do you think that kushwan singh's journalism Kushwan Singh as a journalist affected Kushwan Singh as a literary author. Literary author affected. Right. Affected. Yes. Well, was it in the years? Yes. It did affect it. If you go through his novels, you will find like the kind of realism what he has felt in his personal life or his in professional life. He has converted into fiction and produced marvelous books. Thank you. is it visible
uh, good evening to all uh, third presentation topic is that functional way of teaching english language with regards to finishing school initiative by kcg this is the road map of my presentation at first i would like to uh, discuss in a brief that what is elt and what is the pedagogy of the elt what is the functional approach key concept in the functional grammar relationship between the spoken and the written language traditional grammars how differs from the functional grammar examples of both the types of grammar teaching functional english language implementations of functional english teaching and learning finishing school by kcg syllabus of that finishing school by kcg and the observations of finishing school training first and foremost thing that what is elt and pedagogy we all know that the elt is a very broader term and pedagogy means to act of learning so in which we can see that the pedagogy means interaction between teachers students and the learning environment and the learning task and for english language teaching as i discussed in my earlier presentation that there are various types of methods and approaches are there so for teaching language there is a different kinds of pedagogy we can use uh, for students here i would like to discuss the functional approach that this approach is very uh, new approach that how this functional approach is a systematical functional linguistics linguistic is developed by michael halliday in the year 1960s this approach mainly focuses on written and spoken skills so Halliday wrote a very wonderful and very important book and introductions to functional grammar in which he discussed all the things in detail that this book mainly focuses on which topic that to teaching of grammar with the functional approach rather than the formal approach so this functional approach we can say that basically for efl teachers means english for foreign learners uh, teachers as well as students this functional approach deals with the three distinct senses text of the system and of the elements of the linguistic structures so here my concern is that more about the broader term english functional language how to teach functional language in which grammar is you can add uh, uh, very naturally so functional grammar is based on a social and cultural context so this grammar is totally different from the traditional grammar that is uh, we will discuss in next slide that how these functional grammars differ from the traditional grammar so functional grammar is what that it is a natural grammar means in the sense that everything in it can be explained ultimately by reference to how language is used means we have to teach students how to use language in a practical way not the rules and the regulations of the grammar that we may be studied in our uh, uh, school time some key concept in the functional grammar so first is that that the functional grammar has its own characteristics that's why it is different from the traditional one it works for the communicative purpose so main focus of this grammar is that communication purpose students what functions they have to use and for what purpose they have to communicate so functional grammar has functions and system hierarchical ranking of units word order word groups functions of sentences theme transitivity and the clause complex the another point is very important in this uh, approach is that the relationship between spoken and the written language so most probably both are the same but when we speak at that time we uh, use language in a different way and when we write the same thing at that time also we are more conscious so we write very properly when we speak at that time so both are most probably same but so there are still some minor differences we can uh, see in this concept so this is also very important part in which uh, you can see here i have mentioned that how this functional grammar is a different from the traditional grammar so first we can see that it is a traditional and old so traditional grammar is very old it is based on a form we all know that in our school time we learn that uh, ob uh adverb plus object plus verb so this is a system we can uh, remember but it is very old fashion now next point is that follows rules for perfect sentence structure so students maybe learn the rules and regulations but in practical form they cannot speak properly 
mainly concerned with uh, how language is uh, used. So this is the main features of the traditional grammar. So it, it, it is format based. In traditional grammar, there are 10 parts of the speech, noun, verb, adjective, adverb, pronoun, number of articles. Maybe most happen that students know all the things perfectly on the page, but at the, uh, they can not uh, speak uh, perfectly uh, when they have real need to communicate with the people. Traditional grammars analyze a sentence structures into subject practice, object, attributed, adverbal, and the complement. What happened in the functional grammars? So this is a very new and the modern approach to teach and learn English grammar. This grammar is meaning based, teaches how students, uh, sorry, teaches how sentences are used in a communications because functional approach is for the communicative purpose. It can help learners to use language in a real life context. So in a social and cultural context, more sociological in its uh, orientation. Functional grammar places English words into four big groups like noun groups, verb groups, adjective groups and the prepositions group. Uh, later on, we just discuss also the gram uh, examples of the, uh, that both the uh, grammar pattern. Functional grammars gives a clues different functional levels depending on the three kinds of meta functions. So you can see the two examples of both the grammar traditional grammars. His good friends wrote this book in America. So pronoun, adjective, noun, verb, pronoun, this method we remember. But here you can see that in the functional grammars, some groups are there. Nominal group, verbal group and the propositional group. So his good friend is nominal group, wrote this book, verbal group. In America is preposition group. So this is the grammar. Uh, functional grammar is very deep grammar. But uh, I just mainly focus on the language that uh, how uh, language can teach with the help of this grammar. So functional language means giving the students the language they need to perform a functions or communication in a various situation. So it is also like a situation best to teach English language. Language is used to do everyday tasks like uh, ordering food in a restaurant, buying tickets and apologizing how to greet people. So use communicative activities to explain and practice to, uh, the functions. Repetition is the key to teach language chunks. Here you can find some activities like ordering food, expressing wishes, asking for and giving a personal information, asking questions, asking and giving permissions. These all are the very little activities, but students can learn through this very practically. Now we discussed that this approach is good, but how to implement practically into the classroom? That is very important. So as an English language teacher, we should do first and foremost, prepare a syllabus for the functional English, English grammar. Next, in which you should mainly focus that you should uh, use LSRW main basic four skills for uh, designing activities and tasks. And the next, use functional activities. So which type of activities you can use in your syllabus as an English teacher? So you can use introducing self and others. Let's name it. Describing the people, passing the verb game, pair work, teamwork, group discussions, Q&A sessions, telephonic conversations, vocabulary building, role play, etc. Now, my major concern is that this functional approach uh, finishing school by KCG is running one uh, training for the graduate students. So this training is given to the uh, first year and the second year st uh, students that they have to learn uh, English language. So in which four modules are there, uh, employability and the life skills. And uh, uh, they have two, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, two models and the functional English has, uh, uh, has a two uh, another models. So in which these, these, these are four modules are there for 20 hours. So in which I should mainly focus on the functional English skills. So you can see the syllabus, recent syllabus of these two modules. The topic are very minor, but they teach they, these topics not in a traditional way, but in a very communicative, in a practical way with the activities, games, and students can learn very well within 10 days. But what happened that they should practice not after the training. That is the main, uh, we can say a problem is there my personal observations of finishing school training during training as i have observed this training four times two times during the pandemic uh, online 
way and the uh, last time in the uh, three months before three months in uh, my college uh, this training uh, was organized so at that time also i have particularly observed this training for 10 days that how students can learn a language during these 10 days which type of atmosphere trainer can develop and what happened uh, before uh, before the training students uh, knowledge is uh, uh, they have some kinds of a lacking lack in this lacking in this knowledge but after the training they are just capable to speak three to four lines in front of the people they come on the stage and very enthusiastically participated uh, in this activity so learn more grammar and communication through various tasks and the practical activities audio visuals aids help more to learn english what happened that generally in graduate levels teachers do not use movies and some kinds of you know, audio visual aids but through uh, tra uh, in the training time i just observed that the t uh, trainers can use very well these all audio visual models so they can learn language and they can enjoy the atmosphere to learning that so lsrw skills developed through the activities like a group communications debate a movie review email story report writing what happened that some in engineering colleges one trainer um suggested me or uh, see, uh, said me that that in uh, engineering uh, colleges uh, they uh, students can just come uh, to the prepare one play and they uh, perform drama play in the english so their level is uh, up to the mark so at that time they give some kinds of an uh, training like a toefl and the ielts type of training so they also uh, trainer try uh, try to see the what is the need of the students and then on the basis of that they can teach to the students develop a creative as well as critical thinking movie screening is also there so uh, in between teacher can ask some kinds of a uh, literary aspects also that uh, this symbol is used for that purpose so they can know the how to uh, uh, watch movie with the add some kinds of a uh, theory as well as some kinds of a uh, symbol and etc uh these kinds of inner uh, training will help to develop vocabulary building also so in which students can learn every day 10 new words uh for uh learn new language so in which they uh, sing a song in english so they can learn language so these kinds of inner uh, uh, activities will help a lot students play outdoor games in uh, outdoor games they play uh, two to three games and in which they communicate with each other so they can learn language very well so through these things students can learn this is my personal observations maybe there are some negative impact also but in my further research i will try to observe because still i have not done many uh, good things or we can say in detail so there are some negative points also but i will try to observe critically as well in future also and will give a uh, data uh, this is uh, these are the references which i have used in my presentations thank you Uh, my question is now this functional grammar uh, this is used as a syllabus of finishing school and uh, mostly we can find that it is also there in uh, primary uh, students syllabus so don't you think that there should uh, there should have stages of functional grammar when we are teaching to ba students not school school students but ba students then we should go ahead with uh giving them more stuff instead of uh, teaching them uh the similar functional uh, english again and again yes uh, uh very uh, very good questions uh, asked by pujawa uh, that uh, uh, some uh, proper syllabus should be designed as per the need of the students for example ba students have different different uh, needs and the bcom students engineering students have different needs so these kinds of suggestions i will try to put in my research and will uh, try to suggest them we should do that uh, one uh, as i mentioned earlier that one trainer um, uh, talked me that uh, in engineering colleges especially i think in ahmedabad ali college students have a, uh, their level is very good so we do not teach them noun pronoun verb and all these thing so at the time the uh, syllabus is that same on the paper government paper but they teach uh, some kinds of in a training life uh, we can say that uh, if they want to go outside abroad to study so at the time they give this kinds of in training also but on paper it is not available so we can uh, i just try to find out 
and we'll try to give suggest suggestions uh, also any other question yes uh, as we have already discussed about difference between traditional grammar and uh, functional grammar so there is one approach to teach grammar uh, in natural way that is inductive approach so do you find any similarity between teaching of functional grammar and teaching grammar through this approach of inductive inductive grammar inductive approach okay so uh, functional grammar means to teach grammar in a very natural way so inductive grammar as you mentioned that it is also a natural way to teach grammar so uh, maybe uh, some similarities are there uh, so uh, students can learn grammar in a very natural way not the follow rules and regulations as we uh, studied in our school and college days so maybe uh, both have a similar aspects Can you able to see? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to all of you. Hello to all of you. Good afternoon to all. Here I want to present my topic is and it is the Yes. If it is uh, interfering your text, then it is always better to hide it. Then hide it. Now it is okay. My topic is the psycho picture of Draupadi in the context of Chitra Banerjee Diva Karun is the palace of illusions. Here it is a very well known book which written by Chitra Banerjee Diva Karun and uh, she, she is a very famous author of uh, India. And, and here, uh, here I want to present uh, the, the psycho picture of Draupadi and Draupadi is a very famous and, and uh, uh, well known uh, a figure of Mahabharata, and and uh, in in Mahabharata we can uh, we can uh, see see her as a suppressed character, but uh, here uh, in the Palace of Illusions we can we can uh, see her as a self-dependent woman. First of all, I want to say something about Chitra Banerjee Diva Karuni. Her real name is Chitra Lekha Banerjee and born in July 29, uh, 1956, Kolkata, India. She is an Indian American author, poet, and the Betty, and Shane McDavid, professor of writing at the University of Houston Creative Writing Program. Her works are largely set in India and the United States and often focus on the ex experiences of South Asian immigrants. She writes for children as well as adults and has published novels in multiple genres, including realistic fiction, historical fiction, magical realism, myth and fantasy. Her short story collection, Arranged Marriage, won an American Book Award in 
1996 and her works are the mistress of spices sister of my heart palace of illusion olander girl before we visit the goddess the brotherhood of the corn and here uh, you can find these multiple books but uh, here the palace of illusion is a master blaster book uh, uh, which are uh, written by her and uh, and uh, it, it is a uh, one one special award of man booker prize the palace of illusion the palace of illusion a novel is a 2008 novel by award winning novelist and poet chitra banerji divakar one it was real, uh, released by double day as book list uh, summarizes the plot uh, smart uh, resilient and courageous panchali born of fire mary soul five of the heroic pandava brothers harbors a secret love enduring a love exile in the wilderness instigates a catastrophic war and slowly learns the truth about krishna her mysterious friend here uh, we, uh, here in this novel we can find one special things that uh, uh, her uh, best friend is lord krishna the palace of illusions was a national best seller for over a year in india it is a retelling of indian epic the mahabharata from draupadi's perspective here we can only find the voice of draupadi and her perspective it is a very very good thing that uh, the author right uh, in uh, in her work it is a retelling of indian epic the mahabharata from draupadi's perspective the palace of illusions has also been included among a list of 12 books of indian authors and it is a very good thing and the palace of illusions was adopted into a play named fire and ice dropadi story by george d sabetio and performed in india under his direction and here one one interesting thing is that a bollywood movie also with the title mahabharata starring deepika padukone as dropadi is currently prepared in india based on the palace of illusion the premiere is scheduled very soon and and we, we all will get this beautiful movie which based on draupadi chitra banerjee divakaruni holds a prominent place in indian english writing divakaruni's novel the palace of illusion the retelling of vyasa's the mahabharata has uniqueness of its own and here we can see the difference between the original mahabharata and the mahabharata which created by the chitra banerji diva karuni the palace of illusion is about women discrimination their struggle identity male domination unique female perspective and position of women during the period of mahabharata and here we can see the voice but it is the voice under the uh, patriarchy power and it is a way and uh, in this novel there is a beautifully written by the author the humiliation that went through is given as the challenge of life dropadi's life shows in the epic how women need to accept the concept of tradition and culture without any questions and here we can find the humiliation humiliation of dropadi and it shows the epic that how women need to accept the concept of tradition and culture without any question and in this novel we can also find that uh, the the author choose the tradition and culture and then uh, raise their voice against such injustices the view of draupadi are totally different from this of ordinary woman and the outcomes are as powerful as she is a determination and courage has been explained all through the novel it has its own charm to and hold on the reader where it is ancient or the modern period the life of woman has not had any changes it has had only changes to face and act according to the context it shows how a woman born as a princess suffered in her life and here in this novel draupadi asked many questions to the society that uh, how these all things uh, happened with her and uh, and uh, and in original mahabharata we can find that uh, in many places uh, her voice is suppressed by the people of the society but here the author chitra banerjee diva karuni give her voice to speak out against, against such injustices draupadi's life was seeks to break the shackles of 
stereotypical concept of how women can be women. Our paper is a sincere attempt to explore myth and modernity, clashing with each other to give birth to a new face. It offers a new interpretation of the voice of Draupadi is depicted by the novelist and it is a very unique thing. A combination of traditional mythology and modern mythology here. Traditional mythology means original Mahaparata and modern mythology, mythology means uh, retellings which written by the author in the, in the present era. A combination of traditional mythology and modernity of the present world is presented here through the retelling which is a pre predictable message for those who are rooted in the accepted traditionalism and also for those who remain uprooted from the moral ethics of their own culture. Diva Karuni has shown Draupadi as a contemporary woman who wants to express her thoughts, ideas to the world. Diva Karuni has tried to bring out the past into the present in a different way by showing the story of love, betrayal, revenge, war, freedom and friendship. In the book review of The Palace of Illusion, James Fulton says that a little change at times, Divakaruni's languid and elegant prose remains seductive as it reimagines the woman at the heart of the story and waves the myth into, into a modern idiom. Here, here I want to say about Draupadi and uh, here, uh, uh, here I add something major things which related to Draupadi. Draupadi referred to as Krishna, Panchali and Yagnaseni is the heroic of the Hindu epic Mahaparata which, which we all know about her. She was the common wife of five Pandava brothers Sudhishthir, Prem, Arjun, Nakul and Sahadev. She is described to be the most beautiful woman of her time and was prophesied to bring the end of many warriors. Draupadi and her brother Trishtadyumna were born from a yagna, fire sacrifice, organized by King Drupada of Panchal. Arjun won her hand in marriage, but she married the, the five brothers because of her mother-in-law's mis misunderstanding. Here we can find that how the woman suppressed in the old era. And, uh, Later, Yudhishthi performed the Ratsui ritual and achieved the status of the emperor and she became the queen of Indraprasth. Uh, she had five sons, one from each Pandava who were collectively addressed as the Ap Pandavas. Once Duryodhana, the cousin of the Pandavas and the chief of the Kaurava brothers, invited him to play a, a gambling game in Hastinapur out of envy. After Yudhishthir lost Draupadi in the game, she was humiliated by the Kauravas and abused by Karna. The Kaurava prince uh, Dushasan tried to disrobe her, but the divine intervention of the god Krishna saved her honor, which uh, we all know about it. She and her husband were exiled for 13 years with last year incognito, and uh, then Purukshetra war started for 18 days to take revenge for Draupadi's insult by Kauravas. What is psychology? Here my topic is based on psycho picture of the Draupadi. So we all should know about what is psychology. Psychology is the scientific study of mind and behavior. Psychology includes the study of conscious and unconscious phenomena, including feelings and thoughts. It is an academic discipline of women's scope, crossing the boundaries between the natural and social sciences. Psychologists seek an understanding of the emergent properties of brains, linking the discipline to neuroscience. As a social science, psychologists aim to understand the behavior of individual groups. Here, we have, we have to know about how the Draupadi suffers a lot and, uh, and uh, her uh, suppress the voice to be we don't know that uh, how she suffers but uh, here uh, psychology also we can uh, apply it to her nature major aims presenting drop of this psycho picture in this presentation the retelling refolding and revisiting of mythology has been greatly emphasized which shows the uh, especially perspective of psychology of women it is also describing the changing role of women's understanding in our society 
This study will analyze how the female society differs from the male psychology, especially by contrasting the myth from the Mahabharata. Indian feminists began to step out from the shadow and pre mythology, which was written by men. This was necessary because male discourse elides women. And it is related to original Mahabharata that uh, how uh, male power reduced the female power. Men written myths have the functions to infantilize women, to irradiate the de this function women have to write for themselves in this course. I have taken retelling the Palace of Illusions by Chitra Banerjee Divakarun to study the psychology behind the character of Draupadi that what she thinks and feels behind her injustice in the society. And, and I have also read the whole book and, and the pages are 360. I have read the original book and here I can find the psychology of Draupadi very interesting. And here we can find that in some places Draupadi suffered depression. And so here we all know about what is depression. According to American Psychiatric Association, depression is a common and serious medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. Fortunately, it is also treatable. Here, when uh, when Kunti uh, said to all uh, all Pandva brothers to marry only one uh, Draupadi, then uh, then we can uh, see that how Draupadi feel and suppress and feel depression at that time. Depression causes feelings of sadness and or a loss of interest in activities you once enjoyed. It can lead to a variety of emotional and psych uh, physical problems and can decrease your ability to function at work and at home. Symptoms, feeling sad or having a depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure in activities once enjoyed, changes in appetite, weight loss or gain and related to dieting, trouble sleeping or sleeping too much, increase in purposeless uh, physical activity or slowed movement or speech, thought of death or suicide. And the major region of Draupadi's depression in the life here, here I choose five points. And uh, here these five points, we can say that uh, it is a sign of depression in, the, in Draupadi's life. Her, un, her un, unwelcome birth from the fire when Draupadi born at that, uh, at that time, uh, Draupadi only like, uh, uh, like her brother and don't like Draupadi. And here, we can find such a injustice is which is very which is very uh, uh, dangerous on the mind of the Draupadi and she also faced uh, depression. Uh, she wished to choose her life partner in her own. Her here we can say that uh, Arjuna Arjuna has already uh, already chosen by uh, her father. So so why such a arrangement of a swayam were I happened uh, in the Mahabharata, her polyandrous marriage with the Pandavas, it is also a uh, very suppressed thing. Polygamy marriage of her husband with many queens and princesses, we all know that uh, all, all, all Pandavas uh, uh, have married multiple uh, queens and princesses. Her humiliation in the court of Christ, we all know this about very well that how Draupadi uh, suffered a lot in the court of the dice when uh, uh, when Pandava lost uh, everything in the game of dice and, uh, and this uh, this all the sign of depression which uh, Draupadi may be suffered in her life. Thank you. I have one question that uh, speak loudly. Okay. Uh, can you uh, find any connections or reference uh, uh, with the work of uh, Kajalona with Draupadi in your research area? Uh, no, I, I know that Kajalona with the uh, uh, right one book on Draupadi, but uh, but still I have not referred it. I will refer it.
No, you you won't be audible to all of them because Draupadi it is, of Mahabharat uh, yeah. and Draupadi created uh, by uh, there is a, uh, yes I I get uh, her question what difference you see in Draupadi and Benerjee's Draupadi here uh, we can find a big difference here in uh, original Draupadi we can uh, see him suppressed every time and in uh, Chitra Benerjee Diva Karuni's uh, uh, Draupadi uh, speak out all the things and uh, and uh, and uh, like to choose uh, uh, choose the positivity in her life. Finish. Is it visible? Screen? Today, I am going to present my views on Jit Thail's Tarkopolis as a continuum of Arvind Adiga's Dark India exploration. Thail has been writing poetry since his adolescence. In his prose, as in his poetry, he has introduced new areas of feelings and emotions to Indian literature and has often encountered himself with the pleasures and pains of drug and alcohol and sex and death that are not traditionally connected with the firmament of Indian literature. So he is a kind of writer who is breaking the tradition of Indian English literature and giving new themes which were traditionally not touched upon. So we have studied the white tiger in our MA studies. So white tiger and narcopolis both are the same in many ways. So it looks like as if Jeet Thail is continuing what Arvind Adiga has left in a white tiger. About Narcopolis, Jeet Thail said, I have always been suspicious of the novel that paints India in a soft focus, a place of loved children and loving elders of monsoons and mangoes and spices. To equal Bombay as a subject, you would have to go much further than the merely nostalgic will allow. The grotesque may be a more accurate that means carrying out such an enterprise. So, Dark India. This is the category in which the White Tiger as well as Narcopolis falls. The novel Narcopolis by Jeet Thail fits into the recent literary wave of Dark India, a body of literary fiction which seems to have found a niche in the market, writing as does of underbelly of Indian society, like its slums, poverty, deprivation, and destitutions. Narcopolis, with its setting on Bombay's Shuklaji Street in 1970s and 1980s, crowded with opium dens and brothels, with its caste of drug addicts, drug peddlers, prostitutes, criminals, and even a eunuch, is a book which definitely sets to depict a non-shining India. So many a time we sing a song of shining India, but these are the writers who are throwing lights on the darker side of India, or you can say a non-shining India with all its gutters, which may be a more faithful representation than what it had been known up till 
recently of the exotic, lush, extravagant India. The book mainly chases the story of Hijra, named Dimple, and threw her character into the question of gender, religion, consciousness, and the minds of other characters. The opening sentence of the Narcopolis begins, Bombay, which obliterated its own history by changing its name and surgically altering its face, is the hero or heroine of this story. Jit Thiel's Narcopolis shows the whole other intricate side of Mumbai. What Narcopolis does is that it gives us chance to reread the history of Bombay, the history which is not captured in the history book. So these lines are very interesting. What Narcopolis does, it gives us a new kind of history, a history that is not written in a history book. So Jit Thiel himself was a drug addict and he has gone through this situation. So he knows in a better way. The time is 1970s, drifting into later decades and the narrative spotlight soon falls on one such resident, Dimple, a girlish unit who has who, having grown up in brothel, is now both a prostitute and a sort of moral character. More important, Dimple expertly picks the opium pipes that are consumed in Rashid's den, suck up with an avid clientele. As time goes on, the cast of character enlarges. One of the particular interests is Chinese exile, Mr. Lee, who has had a dangerous falling out with a prominent leader back home but wants nothing more than to return there, whether alive or otherwise. As time goes on too, pipes give way to needles and the city changes its tenor and the drug diet changes, never for the good. Ask Dimple. So this quote is very interesting. Dimple asks, tell me why chemical is freely available when there are no tomatoes in the market? The answer is because the city belongs to the politician and the crooks and some of the politicians are more crooked than the most of the crooked of the crooks. The story is set in Bombay at a time where Hindu-Muslim tension are about to flare up. The pavement stone killer is making a headline for smashing homeless people's sleeping skulls and nights are full of prom promise, perversions and endless nasha. It all takes place on Shuklajit Street, the dilapidated hub of a scene in a cosmopolitan city where dreams hang upside down on a cell, where behind closed doors hide opium dens and it, its gutter overflow with poverty and sodomy, and on its gully walk pimps, prostitutes, beggars and thieves, all gambling fate for living. According to Jit Thail, Mumbai mingles with people, creates problems for people, provides pleasure to people and thrashish people. The novel traverses through the smoke alley of Mumbai's drug world. Mumbai is the central theme of the novel and presents a discerning image of the city with the help of characters, their relationships, behaviors, and style of living. The novel is broken into four books. Book one is The City of O, begins with Dom's arrival in Bombay. It is late 1970s and he quickly weaves himself into the fabric of Bombay's sordid underbelly, specifically the opium dens. Here he meets Rashid, owner of Khana on Shuklaji Street, where much of the novel takes place. Dimple, the beautiful Hijra who works for Rashid, preparing bowls of opium. Bengali, who manages Rashid's money. Rumi, the unflinchingly confrontational businessman whose addiction is violence. Newton Xavier, the celebrated painter who both rejects and craves adulation. Mr. Lee, the Chinese refugee and businessman, and a cast of poets, prostitutes, pimps, and gangsters. Here, people say that you introduce only your worst enemy to opium. The seduction of opium becomes even the most stalwart of men. This book is about drug, sex, death, perversion, addiction, love, and God. And above all, it is a fantastical portrait of a beautiful and damned generation in a nation about to sell its soul. Written in Thiel's poetic and affecting prose, Narcopolis charts the evolution of a great and broken metropolis. Now, we had studied 
white tiger so we all are familiar with white tiger so i am reading some of the key quotes and then i will sum up my presentation in the white tiger adiga bears the startling reality of a nation where unplanned haphazard urbanization and colonization is suffocating the already overburdened infrastructure where the social fabric is being stretched to a breaking point where poverty corruption moral degradation still rule the day where every known tradition is put to test the novel critically analyzes the effect of unbridled capitalism on an emerging economy like india and the social injustice and inequalities that it entails the white tiger throws into relief the discrepancy between the crushing ruler poverty from which the protagonist balram emerges and india's new found status of modern global economy so these are the some of the quotes which will show on the light that how arvind adiga is presenting the darker sides of a nation apparently sir you chinese are far ahead of us in every respect except that you don't have entrepreneurs and our nation though it has no drinking water electricity sewage system transportation sense of hygiene discipline courtesy or punctuality does have entrepreneurs for this land india has never been free first the muslims then british boasters around and in 1947 the british left but only a moron would think that we have become a free then what kind of corruption is there these are also highlighted through some of the quotes there was supposed to be a free food at my school a government program gave every boy three rotis yellow dal and pickle set a lunch time but we never saw rotis or a yellow dal or a pickle and everyone knew why the school teacher had stolen our lunch money the teacher had le- legitimate excuse to till the money he said he hadn't been paid his salary in 6 months next quote is once a truck came into the school with uniforms that the government had sent for us we never saw them but a week later they turned up for sale in neighboring village another quote is no one blamed the school teacher for doing this you can't expect a man in a dung heap to smell sweet there is no duster in the class there are no chairs there are no uniforms for the boys how much money have you stolen from the school funds there are many satires also on indian political systems for example like yunach discussing the kam sutra the waters discuss the election in lakshmangarh i am india's most faithful voter and i still have not seen the inside of a voting booth you have got a good scam going on here next is i am not a pal- politician or a parliamentarian no one of those extraordinary men can kill and move on it's amazing the moment you show cash everyone knows your language so these are the quotes which will show you the reality that what kind of india both the writers are narrating both the na- novel shows darker side of the nation the white tiger and narcopolis has generated tremendous response both from literary and academic circle critics have been lavish in praising the books as they have been in condemning it hail as an extraordinary and brilliant thrilling and insightful witty and unpretentious the novels are considered as some of the most powerful books published in the decade by some critics critics have also opined that novels are tedious and uncanny disappointing and absurd patronizing and officious reading more like a thriller magazine without any moral purpose or justification so these are the some of the views of critics who says about both the novels okay this was from my side thank you i have one question yes, that uh, both uh, major okay what is the political reply of narcopolis what is the political reply of narcopolis yes we have seen with white tiger at the same in the same way there are many people who are against it that you are right writing a selected reality you are not showing the good or better aspect of our society tumne khali gutter oj dekhay che aaj badu dekhay che bharat ganu badu agal nikal gayu so like white tiger there are also people who are condemning the novel and say is that these writers are writing for awards or to pra- for praise or getting appreciation from the west so similar way people are receiving it 
but it is a more a kind of autobiography of jit thail kan ke jit thail himself says that he was the at very young age he became a drug addict and for more than i think 30 or 40 years he himself passes through it e a ena potana jat anubhav hoshe ke pote kai rite drugs na nasha ma phasai che so in a way it is a kind of biography so there is truth also but at the same time people are also opposing it on various grounds my question is that that uh, we uh, see that uh, there are various uh, uh, dif- uh, similarities are there between both the texts but what are the major changes you can find in both the texts narcopolis as well as in white tiger yes narcopolis is a more kind of poetic prose because jit thail himself is a poet so poet and he it is also a kind of autobiography it's about time is 1960s and 70s or 70s and 80s so more focus is on nasha and how opium is killing the people whereas what happens in white tiger whatever comes to his way arvind adika is openly criticizes it koi vastu ne adika baki nahi mukta here focus is mainly on bombay mumbai and what happens in shukla ji street especially shukla ji street that one place is at the center and during around this the entire story evolves so white tiger is criticizing more as entire nation entire india whereas narcopolis focus mainly on bombay anything else do you think that such book like white tiger and narcopolis harm the picture of ideal india or they show up the mirror of a real india okay no there is nothing like harming because there is a famous quote of arvin adiga in which he says that what Th- Th- dickens and balzac did with france and england and that's why their nations are better societies it is not by building a building a shopping malls we can become a better society a development of a character is necessary and gutter saaf karvi j pade to j we can grow into a better society so it's a good that writers are like arvin nadiga or jit thail they are highlighting this darker sides and as a result we can become a better society otherwise we cannot be that ane apne kafta nu ek quote pan we have studied that uh, literature must be an ex on a frozen snow within કે સાહિત્ય યા કુલહાડી નું કામ કરવાનું છે કે આપણી અંદર જે ડઠ્ઠર થઈ ગયેલો જમી ગયેલો બરફ છે જે આપણી ગેરમાન્યતાઓ છે એને તોડવાનું કામ કરવાનું છે સો ધેર ઇઝ નથિંગ લાઈક ડિફેમિંગ ઇટ જો ખરાબ કહેશો ભૂલ બતાવશો તો જ એમાંથી સુધારો થઈ શકશે સો ઇટ્સ અ બેટરમેન્ટ ફોર અવર સોસાયટી સો આઈ થિંક ધીસ કાઇન્ડ ઓફ લિટરેચર ઇઝ ગુડ ટુ મેક અ હેલ્ધી સોસાયટી very good evening uh, the topic of uh, my third presentation is uh, toward developing an interactive language pedagogy for the students of english for vocational purposes uh, this is a flaw of presentation uh, first of all what we mean by pedagogy or language pedagogy in general uh, uh, generally people uh, sometimes uh, having misconception regarding pedagogy that it is gen- uh, only the methodology of teaching a language uh, uh, by using various methods but pedagogy is a very broad term that includes classroom practices techniques theories or uh, the teachers role learners role and many other aspects regarding teaching and learning uh, when we uh, try to focus on language pedagogy uh we have three different views uh looking toward language 
structural view, functional view, and interactive view. Structural view treats language as structurally uh, formed. It is a system of structurally related elements which code meaning. For example, grammar. Or uh, when we teach tenses, we uh, teach students that these are different uh, elements which is combined in a single sentence and that create meaning. So that is a proper structure. So it is a structural view to look at language. Uh, there is another view, functional view which look at language as a vehicle to express our uh, ideas or express our meaning. So to uh, perform various functions like uh, to request someone, to complain someone or to share information. So uh, for this uh, different functions, how we use language in real life context. So that is a functional view to look at language. And the third one is the interactive view, which see language as a vehicle for creation and maintenance of social relations that mostly we do as uh, through the interaction or the communication with other people. Uh, so that is a third view of uh, uh, language teaching and learning. Uh, when we try to uh, uh, see the language pedagogy in context of ESP and EVP. So ESP is already discussed. So I will talk about EVP, English for vocational purpose. It is a category uh, which is fall under the umbrella term of ESP. So generally, uh, we have seen two categories under ESP, that is English for academic purpose and English for vocational purpose, or it is sometimes known as English for occupational purpose. So when you teach English uh, for different needs of vocation or occupation, it is termed as English for vocational purpose. Uh, basically, it is referred to the specific professions or vocation which is based on particular linguistic or communicative requirements or the needs of the language learners. And uh, in that, we have to focus on specific register, which is spoken in the real world context at various workplaces or various occupation. Uh, when we uh, talk about uh, language pedagogy in context of English for vocational purpose, mostly we can connect it with the communicative language teaching because uh, the aim of teaching language, <coughs> specifically English, to vocational students is to develop their communicative competence and communication skills. So communicative language teaching approach that we all know, which is mostly used today, and it is developed quite earlier in 1970s. So these are some of the uh, key facts of uh, the communicative language teaching. Uh, as uh, it demands good command over communication skill rather than only accuracy or knowledge of language. It also focuses to develop competence among the learners, skills among learners rather than just a knowledge about language. It also expected uh, this is a requirement or the demand from the candidates. So it is uh, expected from the employees or the learners who are uh, who will be the future employees to have a good communication skill in English at uh, to work at national as well as international level. Because in context of India, we have also uh, uh, diverse languages, which is uh, we known as a multi-linguistic nation. So to work at national level, even we require link language and that is English mostly that we use. It also focuses on fluency that is must for success, special in field of employment in today's world. It demand appropriate, specific, need-based syllabus and pedagogy, which should be stronger one. Uh, when we talk about interactive approach, uh, interaction is a direct uh, result of communicative approach because it focuses on interaction, the real life interaction among the language learners. So it's involved the activities of real life communication. Uh, basically, interactive approach uh, 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 there is one book by, uh, uh, I forget the name of author, but there is a book uh, titled as Teaching by Principles and Interactive Approach to Language Teaching. So there we have a proper definition that what interaction is or what do we mean by interaction. So interaction is a collaborative. There are stresses on the word collaborative. So there is a, a participation of every members. For example, earlier in traditional approach, uh, uh, mostly uh, participation from each and every members uh, of language community. There is less, mostly teachers speak and there is a less response from respondent, the language learners. But here everyone has equal chance or equal 
uh, opportunity to participate in interaction. So interaction is a collaborative exchange of thoughts, feelings and ideas between two or more people, which resulting in reciprocal effect on each other. So uh, here we can say through interaction, we learn language from each other throughout the interaction. Uh, as I have discussed, it is direct outcome of uh, communicative language teaching approach. It is more learner center and it is meaning based approach rather than form based approach. Uh, it is more natural and spontaneous. So if here, uh, if we try to uh, differentiate interaction and communication on a thin line, so there we can say that communication is more still uh, uh, formal or designed in advance, but uh, interaction done uh, naturally spontaneously we interact with people uh, innovative and interactive teaching of english is expected to lead students having ability to use english both orally as well as in written form these are the core characteristics of interactive approach uh, where teacher work as a facilitator and students uh, being autonomous learner they learn language on their own through interaction uh, uh, the more focus is not given to correct grammatical structure, but on the situation, how students learn language through the situation. Uh, it focuses on language function and ability to use it in interaction. It focuses on specifically designed tasks that help learners become fluent and efficient users of target language. Here, uh, grammar is not totally ignored, but grammar taught with different approach as we have recently discussed about inductive approach so in inductive approach what happened teacher is not directly teaching students the grammar but allows students and ask them to find out the grammatical structure while using language so on their own they develop grammar rules without learning formally classroom activities should be more practical meaningful uh, which, uh, uh, which which should be easily applicable in real life use so here, uh, one contradictory idea, uh, uh, it's come uh, into our mind that uh, some people have said that uh, communicative activities that we use in the classroom, still it is not uh, catering the needs of uh, uh, the learners in real life use. So the communicative activities that we use, it is considered as a pseudo communicative activities. So for example, uh, a speech, role play or interview. These uh, techniques uh, we use in the classroom to uh, develop this communicative approach. But rather than this, we should also uh, suggest learners to go on the field, for example, uh, 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 go and uh, book a flight ticket, go and talk to the call center uh, people. So it is a real life uh, task that we can give to the learners to develop this uh, interactive approach. Uh, here are some of the elements of uh, communicative methodology that one can uh, use uh, it is emphasis on pair or group work so individual or learning language in isolation it is not there in the uh, communicative approach language learn in collaboration so we can say that students or the language learners can learn language through peer learning from each other uh, the, uh, the use of authentic material and situation is very important authentic in the sense that uh, uh, real life uh, use or the real life content or the real life situation that we can use in teaching of language. Provide cultural information. So as we know that language and culture is always connected or they are interrelated to each other. So English language is, uh, language is one but uh, uh, in different culture or in different nation when it is used some cultural uh, words it's connected to english language for example when we talk about indian english so we have some words which is not there in other culture language is same but uh, there is uh, interconnection between culture and language so we should provide them the cultural information when we are teaching language it is more process oriented rather than product oriented is uh, it is focusing on uh, social aspect of learning how we will uh, learn uh, sorry how we will use that language in uh, reality or in actual situation so that the next one is similar to that embedding real life context uh, these are some activities interactive activities or interactive language techniques that we can say uh, 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 or as a teacher we use in the classroom and also we assign tasks 
where students can go out of the classroom in social setting and they uh, do social interaction with the other people on different fields using the target language. So there uh, they have ample opportunities to learn uh, that how language is actually used in the real life context rather than uh, just informal setting. So these all activities are very familiar to us. So I'm not going to discuss each and every one, but uh, one or two I want to focus is flipped classroom. Uh, as a student in department also, we have experienced this uh, uh, method of learning where teacher first assign the task to the learners and then uh, at the end, uh, some discussion had happened to solve the doubts. So in initially what happened when we assign tasks to the students, students interact with each other, they talk to each other, they discuss their ideas by, while using target language. So from each other, they learn the language. Similarly, in problem solving strategy, we give them one problem and in the team or in group, they solve that problem uh, in, uh, by using the target language in discussion, in debate or in sharing the ideas with each other. Uh, the another uh, uh, approach is that uh, task-based language teaching, which is also part of communicative language teaching. When we uh, say that tasks are more important, so uh, when we assign tasks to the learners, they complete the task by using target language. So it's ultimately develop their fluency, their confidence, and they learn how to express the meaning while using that language. Uh, so it is uh, the task-based language teaching, which is developed by N.S. Prabhu in his Bangalore project. One single, ex uh, I, I want to end this with single example that uh, uh, my focus is on syllabus of Vivo courses. So I have uh, analyzed, I have seen syllabuses of various universities and uh, recently I have uh, received a syllabus of uh, one paper, which is offering to Vivo course and that is functional English. So uh, uh, I have found these activities, they have mentioned in their syllabus that for unit one is about comprehension task, comprehension of picture, what they are understanding from picture, and they have to dis uh, describe it into English. Uh, so picture comprehension, reading, listening comprehension, even comprehension of charts and table. Unit two, they are focusing on function like greetings uh, to peers and others while using target language and many other function language awareness task to inform instruct to convince to entertain uh, and uh, for various function how language can be used write well speak well so uh, they are also focusing on both writing and speaking so for speaking they are using activities like introducing yourself speaking on given topic uh, communicating in formal as well as an informal situation so these are some activities which I found and it is related to this approach of interaction or interactive approach. So uh, these are uh, some of the examples of uh, how we can integrate interactive approach in language teaching uh, uh, in our context. Thank you. Uh, if you have any question. My question is that that interactive uh, to interact and communicate both are the uh, little bit different but on the other way we can say it is the same so uh, can you identify any changes between interactive approach and communicative approach to teach english language uh, mostly as you mentioned that it is similar quite similar when we try to find some characteristics elements similar in interaction as well as in communication uh, but uh, I cannot say uh, specifically that this is difference, but interactive approach is part of communicative approach. Communicative approach is broad one and interactive is part of uh, communicative approach. And uh, uh, the single difference that I find is that in interactive approach, uh, they are stressing on interaction, which happens spontaneously on the spot, naturally. And uh, out of that, how language uh, can be learned in more uh, direct way. So that basic difference I found. Uh, what are the limitations of interactive approach because uh, i am in doubt that it's not possible to deal with interactive approach everywhere so do you think that it has its own limitations and if yes then what are they yes 
uh, as we know that there is a long history of methods and approaches. So if there is a long history, so each method and uh, each approach have their own limitation, then only new approach come into context. Uh, context. So uh, yes, as you mentioned that this approach will not work everywhere. But as I mentioned specifically in context of uh, teaching English for vocational purpose and specifically to adult learners. So interactive approach and communicative approach, uh, as per my view, uh, it is more uh, workable with adult learners. So uh, if we talk about limitation, um, uh, I think uh, accuracy uh, uh, will be there, but uh, at some level, uh, students uh, who are engaged in the interactive approach ultimately they will develop their practical skill but at some point maybe uh, it happened that uh, regarding accuracy formal rules or structure maybe there is a less chance to learn this uh, as per my view so this can be one uh, limitation of this approach Example of interactive approach to teach grammar. Uh, yes, uh, one example of interactive approach to teach Yes, uh, interactive approach can be used uh, to teach various language elements. So, for example, if we want to teach uh, tenses. Uh, from gram uh, from grammatical point of view, so we uh, assign a task to the students that, uh, for example, two students are there. One can uh, talk to other, and they are uh, reporting that what they have done yesterday. So, for example, if I want to teach them past tense, so I will uh, ask them to uh, interact that what you have done, and uh, it is happened or there is chances that directly students will not use. It, uh, true or the right tenses so there if they are doing mistakes in between we can uh, tell them that for example if you mention that participate so you cannot use participate but participating so through interaction if they will do some mistake in between so we as a teacher uh, there should be uh, uh, we, we teacher should guide them or we work as a facilitator so when they will use this in conversation and then uh, we correct them so that uh, uh, will be more practical and they will remember this and again in the next uh, conversation task they will not do the same error so this i think can be uh, the example of teaching grammar with interactive approach Good afternoon again. The topic for this paper number three presentation is uh, Arthur and George. It's the title of the text by Julian Barnes. Arthur and George, confusion of the creator and the character. Now, uh, let me tell you something about the novel and then we will uh, come to the topic. Uh, this text is uh, discussing the case that that is an historical event which happened. Uh, in reality. So it is about two characters, two protagonists, George Adelji and Arthur Conan Doyle. Now these two are, uh, these two existed in reality and it is not just about one historical event because the text begins with their biographies. 
so uh, with their uh, birth and their childhood the child uh, the book progresses towards the main event so it is a kind of a biography of these two uh, characters as well as it is also talking about uh, the major event so uh, george edelji was a solicitor in 1903 and uh, he was sentenced to 7 years as hard labor for allegedly mutilating animals so this was happened in 1903 In 1906, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the famous creator of uh, Sherlock Holmes series, he began to he began the case again and campaigned for Edelge's innocence. Culminated granted partial pardon in 1907. So this was uh, the uh, case in reality that happened in 1906, and from this major event, Julian Barnes has uh, written this novel. But uh, the event is not the focus because it begins with uh the early childhood of these two characters so it is biography of these two protagonists and this book ends with a very interesting note from the author whatever he has uh searched about this event now these two characters are put in such a way the text begins with contrasting these two characters so one uh, was author and another one was a lawyer so at the life stories of arthur and george is kind of a dichotomy between truth and fiction lawyer you find that uh, he is always searching for the truth and uh, searching for logical arguments where uh, arthur remains busy in building fictions again even from the early childhood we can notice that george's childhood is about uh, finding the truth or uh, uh he is near to truth he has never heard any fictional stories but arthur believed in imaginative and adventurous uh, stories now uh, his uh, parents used to uh, tell him so he has this uh, fictional spirit or uh, he has the power of imagination that is from the beginning we can notice now these two characters are contrasting arthur as an author of sherlock holmes and uh, uh, george is the the character who is there to contrast if there is no lie if there is no imagination then we can never catch the truth or uh, we cannot find the difference between what is truth and what is fiction so uh, uh, george's character is, george's character is portrayed in such a manner that one can notice that this way arthur is more imaginative this way uh, his character is uh, built on the basis of fiction and uh, george is near to the truth he himself impersonates holmes means arthur conan doyle who uh, was the creator of holmes he impersonates himself in place of sherlock holmes and he is assigning some tasks thinking that uh, his secretary wood is actually dr watson the character he has created so it is uh, like he wants to play the role of uh, uh sherlock holmes and then he also assumes that his secretary is uh, dr watson so he starts assigning some uh, tasks to uh, his secretary wood the frontier between sir arthur as investigator and defender of an innocent victim and conan doyle as writer becomes blurred so now this is the confusion that uh, here you find that arthur conan doyle the author is supposed to take care of the investigation of the case of george edelgi but instead of this uh, uh, he impersonates himself uh, in the form of uh, uh, sherlock holmes so there is a confusion is he the only uh, author or is uh, he trying to be sherlock holmes now there are some uh, reasons to impersonate arthur as a uh, sherlock holmes it's not uh, himself but there are many other factors working behind this the first one is that uh, the craze of sherlock holmes in those days you find that uh, conan doyle was receiving too many letters addressed uh, as sherlock holmes addressed to sherlock holmes to his address i mean he is receiving some of the letters because people think that sherlock holmes is a kind of a real character and they are sending letter to sherlock holmes so conan doyle is receiving letters with the name of holmes not only this one but when 
wherever he goes, you find that in a uh, news headline, it puts like Sherlock Holmes found here. It's not Sherlock Holmes, but it is actually Arthur Conan Doyle roaming here and there. But then uh, he is put or the name Sherlock Holmes is used to indicate Conan Doyle. So it's not just his fault that he starts understanding that he is Sherlock Holmes. Arthur's interest in playing role of detective. So in, even if he believes that George Edelgey is innocent, but he is not uh, assigning this task to any other detective. Instead of this, he himself is taking the role of detective because he wants to perform the role of Sherlock Holmes. So uh, this how he he wants he is impersonating himself in the form of uh, Holmes. And he is assigning tasks to his secretary as Dr. Watson. Uh, not only this one, but he is following similar methods which he has used, which he has created while writing the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Method beginning with an ending. So this uh, method he is using in uh, the real investigation of Edelge's case as well as he is referring the method, telling that this is the same method he has uh, uh, created while discussing uh, Sherlock Holmes' stories. And he is not able to bifurcate between his writing and the reality. And this mystery, the case of George Edelge remains a mystery. This is kind of a thing that he is not able to solve. Like Sherlock Holmes shares everything in uh, his fictional text. But this is a mystery because he is not able to bifurcate reality and the fiction he has created. So he was not able to catch the guilty. Uh, in uh, this Edelge's case. Now, these are some of the arguments with which we can prove that he is not able to bifurcate between his reality and his writing. There is a quote in the book, as he set to work, Arthur felt back on familiar ground. When he was investigating, he feels that it was like starting a book. You had the story, but not all of it. Most of the characters, but not all of them. Some, but not all of the casual link means every time while investigating he is comparing it to writing a novel or creating a fictional world so he can never put his author's side aside and focus on uh, the investigation and, and try to remain in a different universe another example is reading doyle's article this is where uh, uh, George Edelge is reading article written by Doyle about Edelge himself. So what if you find your own portrayal uh, done by someone when uh, George is reading, he finds that where Doyle is wrong. Reading Doyle's articles about the case in the Daily Telegraph, George feels like a character in a novel. In this way, he is describing, Conan Doyle is describing the real identity character in a novel, partly because it believes Arthur has fictionalized some aspects of his personality. This was all true and yet untrue, flattering yet unflattering, believable yet unbelievable. So this is how George finds himself portrayed by a Doyle in a newspaper. It's not about a fiction, uh, about a fiction or uh, writing a novel, but it is uh, he is portraying in newspaper. So this is how you find that uh, the thing universes, as I told you in my previous presentation, the ontological universes are meeting with each other. The author cannot keep aside himself. So there is always an impact of uh, uh, author. Sorry, uh, there is always an impact of character in author's mind. So. We used to study biographical or autobiographical elements in a, in a novels, like uh, in which character author has portrayed himself. But this is something uh, opposite. It's, it's a vice versa, where you find that the character is affecting uh, author. The author is not affecting the character, but the character is a being uh, author himself. Or, uh, author is trying to impersonate himself in the form of a character. Now, there are, these are some of the important points which proves that there is a confusion in the mind of Arthur Conan Doyle because he himself feels or he himself has this influence of his character Sherlock Holmes and the imaginary world he has created. 
Arthur's failure as a detective, and because he cannot buy forget, he fails to solve the case. Anson, there was one character, the policeman, and George account for Arthur. Every time they are noticing Arthur, George, and Anson that Arthur is wrong, and there is an influence of uh, his fictional character on uh, Arthur, and that's why many times he is not able to see the truth logically. Arthur distinguishes between his fictional ground and the reality, and when he fails to solve the mystery. you find that he he realizes that this was wrong he regrets the lack of coincidence between his real investigation and the fictional matter it's not meant to happen like this said arthur i should know i have written it enough times it is not meant to happen by following simple steps it's meant to seem utterly insoluble right up until the end so this how uh, he realizes that he has done a mistake to understand uh, reality as a fiction and arthur's autobiography uh that's the real autobiography arthur conan doyle has written the title is memoirs and adventures there are some passages taken from this which proves that uh, uh he this is actually mistake of arthur because the influence of sherlock holmes upon himself is too much this was where sir arthur's access of enthusiasm has led him and it was all george decided the fault of sherlock holmes sir arthur has been too influenced by his own creation holmes performed his brilliant acts of deduction and then handed villains over to the authorities with their unambiguous guilt written all over them and this this statement some making this clear that he has influence of his own character he cannot by forget that Sherlock Holmes is just a character, and uh, he was only a creator. He doesn't belong to that similar world. Now, this is from my side, and these are the sources I have taken for this. can you tell just a story in a brief so that we can understand the concept in a better way because we don't have direct experience or we don't have read that novel so it becomes a bit difficult to connect the dots so if we know the story then we can all all understand it in a better way so just a story or a summary part yes i have described this in one sentence that there was a case it's a uh, it, it has actually happened in reality that there was a case against george edelgi who was himself a solicitor uh and uh the guilt he is detected with his mutilating animals uh injuring an animal in such a way that the animals are supposed to be killed otherwise they they are going to uh, feel the pain so much so that they they must be shot dead so this was case against george edelgi who was lawyer and he was also sentenced for uh imprisonment he was in prison for some years but he was actually innocent it's kind of a uh, punishing someone who has never done crime so he was punished for some years and then uh, this this uh, this case was read by arthur conan doyle who was author of this sherlock holmes and then he tried to solve the mystery he tried to solve or uh, tried to find the guilty but he was not able to find and because there was a uh, much uh, uh, you, you can find that there was uh, much sympathy towards george edelgi and of course you find that the public is with arthur conan doyle so if doyle is telling that uh, george edelgi is innocent then of course people are going to believe this so uh, uh, he started the case again but he failed to uh, to prove that he is not the guilty but then partial pardon was given to george edelgi after uh, after passing the punishment of after living uh, in prison for some years after the punishment he received and then partial pardon was given to him so the problem is that why sherlock uh, sorry after conan doyle was not able to solve the mystery it is because 
uh, the first thing is that he was author, not an investigator. But he performed the role of investigator because he was too much influenced by his own character, uh, Sherlock Holmes. And then he was not able to realize or uh, not able to catch the methods, how he should uh, solve the case. So uh, he followed the methods he has created while writing this uh, Sherlock Holmes series. That's why he fails. And then you find that in uh, too many uh, references, uh, it is clear that he was too much influenced by Sherlock Holmes. And George Edelge was a lawyer and that's why he can see the truth. I mean, he is too much logical in comparison to uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, I have a simple question that as you have mentioned that uh, the sty uh, writing style of the author and there you mentioned that what method he used and that is beginning with ending. So uh, is there any purpose of the author uh, selecting the style of writing? Or this method is uh, Arthur Conan Doyle is using this method in his uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes writing means this how Sherlock Holmes tries to solve the mysteries beginning with an ending or ending with a beginning so this is a matter Sherlock Holmes is adapting to solve the case now uh, this matter is referred by Conan Doyle while he is solving the case of Edelgy in reality so he thinks that let me adopt this matter which I have created for Sherlock Holmes but this matter will not work in reality while solving the case of uh, uh, that's why he was not able to find the guilty so he, he is taking everything from fiction mostly you find that uh, uh, when we are studying novel there is always a question that autobiographical elements in the novel so we connect that uh, in which places or in which character author is visible this is opposite of it where and uh, uh, why or in, in which way author is influenced by his own character. This is something opposite. That Sherlock Holmes is affecting Conan Doyle. So this uh, this how it affected. So the, that's why it is ontological indeterminacies. Means the author is forgetting that this is the another world I belong to. It seems like he, he is a character and he is assigning tasks to his secretary and he is performing the role of Sherlock Holmes. So these two universes are most in the mind of Conan Doyle. Okay, so now the final presentation by Pooja. You have to make mic proper here. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Uh, just a minute. Okay, now you can start. Okay. Good evening to all of you. I am Pooja Tripathi and today I want to make my presentation on my third paper that is of course for paper number three and it is about the six books, a short story collections which I have selected for my uh, research work. So let me share my presentation with you. The topic for my presentation is cultural crossroads and womanhood. Now, women are, are at the major part of diaspora. When uh, I have already said that my topic of presentation um, research is diaspora, and when women are transferred in the another country, how they feel, what are their reactions, that these all things are reflected in literature. 
basically diaspora is all about the cross cultural experiences it is not about a physical dislocation only but of psychological dislocation emotional dislocation you are transferring to the completely a new country host land and at that point how do women feel because diaspora basically is a patriarchal concept the moving from one place to another is always a male decision while creating a home in the another place it is a female instinct so how, but this female instinct this role of women is not highlighted in the past so how gendering diaspora helps in understanding womanhood in the host land that that is the main thing because uh, see if you are creating a new home in the host land then creating home meeting uh, stitching then a uh, cooking all this cultural experiences wearing clothes that are in the part of women so how uniting diaspora with womanhood changes the picture of looking at diaspora as yamin hussein noticed in his a uh, book writing diaspora south asian women culture and ethnicity that diasporic journeys are not simply casual travel but the crossing of physical and psychological border and how this crossing of border affect women because women are the custodians of culture and how they create home in the other land partha chatterjee suggest of the national movement in india that the home was the principal site for expressing the spiritual quality of any national culture and women must take the main responsibility of protecting and nurturing this quality so the more burden of creating a new home is on the shoulder of women and how they react it is not possible that they always recreate the home in the other land they revive culture relive culture but at the same time when women cross the borders they want to get rid of the old culture so there is a dual way of responding to the cultural shock that women face and what is we term as a cultural cross either the women are trapped by the their past by the environment in which they have grown and brought up or they are fascinated by the new freedom of new land you here you can see the two pictures one is from the movie the name say and others are the picture of a women who has gone abroad for their future so in one picture the lady is living in the same way in the other land even the new land even or you can see in the change uh, change in of women in clothes in their appearance in their name civil and both these experiences are aptly expressed in the indian descended women authors of diaspora there are three authors and i have taken the quotes of all the three how diaspora has affected them and when you know how diaspora has affected the writers the same thing is reflected in their characters for example bharti mukherjee was the old generation diasporic writer but still she feels that i am a one of the americans i am one of you she constantly says that she says i totally consider myself as an american writer i am the first among asian immigrant writing to be making this distinction between expatriate and immigrant writing she wants she tells that i want to be the mainstream writer of america rather than expatriate and Amer immigrant writing i am writing about an american group who are undergoing many transformation within themselves so so she looks at the diaspora in a positive way and want to assimilate with the culture of america with the uh, culture of host land while we talk about chitra banerjee she is uh, not uh, she is not only supporting the host land but also creating homeland so she is uh, creating both homeland and host land in her uh, write ups and her women characters reflect this dual feeling if it is uh, when it is asked to chitra banerjee that do you consider yourself as a immigrant or expatriate what she replies it it's a good question do i can consider myself as immigrant or expatriate but my attitude is more inclusive 
I feel both American and Indian. I feel I have two homes, two cultures to call my own. Both have enriched my life and writing. So she is such a writer who easily managed being at homeland and postland. When we talk about Chumpa Lehri, she cannot, uh, even if she is a new generation diaspora writer, she cannot mingle with the new culture of America easily. She thinks that it is very hard to think of myself as an American. For migrants, the challenges of exile and loneliness, alienation, how their children will assimilate with the culture, that is very challenging. All these three different views are reflected in their short story writing given. There are different topics at which female character reacts. First of all, the first point is identity. Identity crisis is a universal theme of diaspora writing. Whether male or female, identity crisis happen in diaspora. But when we talk about female identity, so sometimes female uh, maintain the same identity that they had in their host life. They don't want to get rid of it. For example, when we talk about the character of uh, Mrs. Sen in uh, the short story collection, Interpreter of Melodies. So Mrs. Sen doesn't want to change anything in foreign. There is one poem by Uma Parmeshwaram when a mother says that, I am too used to the natural things, the sounds of birds, the sounds of rain and water. I'm not uh, too used to with this uh, harshness, harsh sounds of washing machine and fan running throughout the day. Son, please open the door and let me go back. So the mother is misfit. Her identity is not there in host land. She wants to come back to the homeland. So this identity crisis, while we talk about the character of uh, uh, Savit, uh, Savita in the clothes by uh, the short story in the collection of Arranged Marriage by Chitra Banerjee. She is wearing sari in the foreign land. But when her husband dies, she doesn't want to come back as a widow and to be uh, on the shoulder burden, uh, to be as a burden on the shoulders of her family for the whole life. Rather, she wants to live in America and cherish the dream that uh, she and her husband have uh, seen in American life. When we talk about marriage life, most of the women uh, from India migrated to the host land uh, with, with their marriage, as a part of their marriage. But when uh, marriages are managed in host land, the reaction is different. Sometimes women decide to uh, run away from the traditional marriage life, like in disappearance from the collection of arranged marriage. We see that the wife disappears. She goes out of the home without telling anything to husband and after many years husband realizes that she was not happy with him so this uh, cultural shock happens of um, in marriage life then feminism obviously feminism comes up women want to have their own home their own uh, business in foreign land gender roles are always replaced in host land that males stay at home many a times and women go out for the work. So man subject, women object, this traditional method doesn't work in a foreign land. They become breadwinner, they become homemaker on their own. And contrasting pictures are there between society and personal trait. Like in uh, Jasmine by Bharti Mukherjee, a character becomes uh, owns her own business she doesn't want to identify herself as a widow, but she utterly wants to start a new life. So search for self in other land we find in uh, this uh, short story writers and their female character. So when we talk about the female experiences of diaspora, we have utterly a new picture of diaspora writer. And that is what we propose to analyze in the new researches of diaspora writing. This is all from my side. If you have any questions, I welcome your questions. So from your study, 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 from your study.
So from your study, uh, what are you able to find about uh, uh, women that uh, do you think that women are not that much adaptive in comparison to men, adaptive of culture? Okay, uh, when uh, from my experience, if I have gone through the short story, I have seen that female adapt culture more easily rather than men. Because uh, if I talk about the story of Hema and Kaushik or disappearance or this clothes, women have easily adopted the culture rather than me. And they want to assimilate with the culture rather than coming back to the patriarchal traditional culture of India. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, I have one question that as you have mentioned uh, that you have selected field authors and uh, you have also uh, mentioned about the uh, experiences, diasporic experiences of women authors. So can you give examples of male authors who had the same experiences of diaspora or uh, they have expressed it in literary books? Yeah, we have writers like Ved Mehta, uh, then A.K. Ramanujan. Uh, then uh, uh, they have written about the male and female experiences of diaspora and they have highlighted how diaspora affected different genders differently. Okay, so that was the last presentation of the day and uh, let us end our presentation with uh, uh, this one uh, with this your coursework in a way comes to an end officially uh, your phd coursework comes to an end uh, with the final presentations uh, here uh, the necessary documents you will submit uh, uh, today uh, before going home uh, for this Ujaba, you also can come and submit the documents as early as possible. So on Monday, we can uh, submit all the necessary documents to uh, university. Okay. And wish you all the best for your research journey uh, for the coming day years. Uh, be punctual and complete your work in due time so that unnecessary time is not extended uh, in your research work. Wish you all the best for your research journey. Okay.